together this morning. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Townsville Worship Centre this morning. I'm just going to open up in prayer before we start worshipping, continue worshipping after the prayer meeting we've been worshipping. Heavenly Father, I just thank you that we are all here today, Lord, and we are here for one purpose, and that is you, Lord God. Lord, I just pray that all the distractions of the week won't be coming to our front of our mind, but we will fix our eyes and focus on you, Lord Jesus. Lord, we just thank you that you love us so much, Lord. And Lord, there's nothing that we could do for you to love us more, Lord. Lord, I just pray today that you can just meet personally with each of us here and each person watching at home, Lord God, that you can fill us afresh today, Lord, that we can go out and make a difference to our families and to the people in the city and where we live, Lord God. We just pray that you will make a way for them too to come to know you and know that love that you have for them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's raise a hallelujah this morning. <laughs> I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah than the unbelief I raise a hallelujah my weapon is a melody I raise a hallelujah heaven comes to fight for me I'm gonna sing In the middle of the storm, louder and louder, you're going to hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated, the King is alive. I raise a hallelujah. Everything inside of me, I raise a hallelujah. I will watch the darkness flee. I raise a hallelujah in the middle of the mystery. I raise a hallelujah, fear you lost your hold on me, amen. I'm going to sing in the middle of the storm, louder and louder, you're going to hear my praises roar, up from the ashes, hope will arise. In the middle of the storm, louder and louder, you're going to hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated, the King is alive. 
Sing a little louder. 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 Sing a little louder, 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 in the presence of my enemies, sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. My weapon is a melody. Sing a little louder. Heaven comes to fight for me. Sing a little louder. In the presence of my enemies. Sing a little louder. Louder than the unbelief. Sing a little louder. My weapon is a melody. Sing a little louder. Heaven comes to fight for me. Sing a little louder. In the presence of my enemies. Sing a little louder. Louder than the unbelief. Sing a little louder. My weapon is a melody. Sing a little louder. Heaven comes to fight for me. I'm gonna sing. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated, the king is alive. I'm gonna sing. I'm gonna in the middle of the storm louder and louder you're gonna hear my praises roar up from the ashes hope will arise death is defeated the king is alive i raise a hallelujah In the presence of my enemies, I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah, my weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me. I raise a hallelujah. I raise a hallelujah. I raise a hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Water, you turned into wine. Open the eyes of the blind. There's no Into the darkness you shine, out of 
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Grace that flows like a river. Washing over me, fount of heaven, love of Christ, overflow in me. Thank you, Jesus. You said.
Christ my Savior, you rescued me. Take this life delivered, a vessel of your Grace that flows like a river. Grace that flows like a river, washing over me. Fount of heaven, love of Christ, overflow. Thank you, Lord. Holiness, holiness is what I long for. Holiness. 
Jesus is what I need. Holiness, holiness is what you want from me. Faithfulness. Faithfulness, faithfulness is what I long for. Faithfulness is what I need. Faithfulness, faithfulness is what you want from me. So take my heart. So take my heart and form it. Take my mind, transform it. Take my will, conform it to yours, to yours, O Lord. Righteousness, righteousness. Righteousness is what I long for. Righteousness is what I need. Righteousness, righteousness is what you want from me. So take my heart. So take my heart. is what I long for. Holiness is what I need. Holiness, holiness is what you want from me. Faithfulness. Faithfulness, faithfulness is what I long for. Faithfulness is what I need. Faithfulness, faithfulness is what you want from me. So take my heart. So take my heart and form it. Take my mind, transform it. Righteousness, righteousness, righteousness is what I long for. Righteousness is what I need. Righteousness, righteousness is what you want from me. So take my heart. So take my heart. Take my heart. So take my heart and form it. So take my mind, transform it. Take my will, conform it to yours, to yours, O oh Lord, holiness. Holiness, holiness is what I long for. Holiness is what I need. Holiness, holiness is what you want from me. Thank 
you, Lord. above all names. above all names. Jesus, name above all names, beautiful Savior, glorious Jesus.
confess that he is long there is a cross that reminds me there's only one who is worthy and there is a great a savior for the sinner there is a savior for the sinner he is my friend and my forgiver there is new mercy that flows like rivers it washes me it washes me, I believe, I believe in Jesus, he is the Son of God, he died and rose to save my soul, I confess that he There is a cross. There is a cross that reminds me there's only one who is worthy. There is a grave forever empty. Oh, I believe. Yes, I believe. confess that he is Lord. He our Lord. You are Lord. I confess you are Lord. My salvation, my reward. You are all I'm living. Go. 
God this morning. We're here to praise the Lord. We're not here to let it trickle out of the corner of our mouths. We're not here to begrudgingly praise Him. We're here to shout because victory is the Lord's. Amen. Don't be a limpet on a rock. Get up there and lift up your hands and praise the Lord, especially if you're miserable, especially if you're in the gloomy pit. Begin to praise the Lord. Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas in the inner prison. And what did they do? They sang praises. Hallelujah. And they really made a nuisance of themselves because they did it at midnight when everyone else was trying to sleep. They said, oh, forget that. Let's praise the Lord. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. Come on, now stand up where you are. Come on, stand up. (laughs) Amen. Wiggle those weak knees. Praise God. Don't uh, accept any infirmity this morning. Say, I'm going to praise the Lord. Now, I'll tell you something else you should do. According to the Bible, lift up your hands. Amen. Lift up your hands. Now, I'll tell you something else that the Bible says you should do. Open up your mouth. Hallelujah. And shout. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Don't be inhibited. Don't be Lord, uh, cast down. The Lord wants to give you victory this morning. He wants to bless you. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. The Lord's on the throne. And I've got a secret for you. You're sitting there with him. Amen. Oh, yes, you've got the victory, hallelujah. Not because you earned it, not because you deserve it, not because you worked for it, not because in any way you're so desirable that he can't help but bless you. He did it because he loves you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to bind the enemy this morning in the name of Jesus and come against him in Jesus' name over all depression, over all sense of abandonment, over every failure that you have thought that you succumbed to and gave yourself to. I break that power of suggestion out of the pit this morning. And I thank you, Lord, there's victory in your name. I thank you that you love us with an everlasting love. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to God. Amen. Hallelujah. You're not a failure. You're not a failure. You're just a potential victor. Amen. That's it. Praise God. Give the Lord praise. Amen. (laughs) Hallelujah. Am I stirred up? Sure. And I did that myself. You stir yourself up. You talk to yourself. The Bible says, stir up that gift that is in you. Uh Uh-huh. You say, well, that's very self and that's very soulish. Forget it. Amen. The Bible says, I will praise him. I have set the Lord before me and I will give him the praise. Now, I have a word of knowledge this morning. Whether someone here in this place or watching online, irrespective, it doesn't matter to us. It's the person that counts. Abandonment. You've been abandoned. And you've got a spirit of abandonment. You've got a spirit of lostness. You've got a spirit of feeling alienated from anyone and everyone because you were walked away from, you were neglected, and you were abandoned. And I want to tell you that you need to say to the Lord this morning, Father, you know my broken spirit. I've kept it to myself. I don't let anybody know. And really... To stay away from being hurt again, I don't let anyone in again. I'm not going to go through that again. And the Lord says, today I'm going to heal you of abandonment. I am going to break the chain of bondage. I am going to take away that spirit of heaviness. And you are going to be free and filled with the presence of God. Amen. So let me pray for you, whoever you are. And I know nothing beyond that. Father, in the name of Jesus, bless this dear soul today, or souls, and I pray that that hollowness, that emptiness, 
that loneliness within will be healed in the name of Jesus. I pray that the Spirit of God will begin to flow down into that yielded spirit, that wounded spirit, that lost spirit. Father, I pray that you'll restore that soul as you promised in Psalm 23. He restores my soul and my cup runs over and surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell, I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Hallelujah. Oh, God, just infill, infill. We don't want you just to throw your arms around that person. We want you to get inside of them and fill them with yourself. Fill them with the one that will never leave them nor forsake them, who will ne never let them down, who will never cast them off, who will never say, oh, I'm sick of you. I'm going elsewhere. Thank you, Lord. You abide faithful in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. 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 And the people said, Amen. Oh, they did too. Amen. Praise God. Turn to someone and say, You look better now. <laughs> well, I think they do. <laughs> and if they don't, if they don't, kid yourself. Hallelujah. They will look better a little later on. Praise God. Well, good morning to you this morning. Hallelujah. Praise God. What a, what a beautiful morning it is this morning. Balmy breezes flowing up from the river, down the valleys, the gully breezes that they have in Adelaide, they have here. Oh, it's a beautiful day. It's going to be 30 degrees with a lovely sea breeze. Hmm. I'm glad I live here. I think of all my family living in metropolises and I thank God that I didn't have to get into a traffic jam to get here this morning. I got here in four minutes and 37 oh. seconds. <laughs> and that was going under the speed limit because about four weeks ago I went seven kilometres over the speed limit on Nathan Street and paid $320 for it. So I'm in a criminal. Oh, Ross has brought his twin. How nice. <laughs> Praise God. Well, we're going to come around the Lord's table right now. And Di is going to come and bless her and bless us. Amen. Praise God. Did I get that right? You did. You look beautiful today. Oh, thank you, Tony. Suits you. Thank you. Oh, and then you got... Oh, I see. <laughs> oh, I can't wait to see what's going to happen. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Are you all well? Yes. Well, I have some friends who are not so well, so I'm going to pray for them this morning. At some stage of the game, they were here last week and it was so good to see them. It's not going to work? Can you put that back a bit? All right. All right. The best laid plans of mice and men. Now, when you first see the bear, what, what scripture do you think of? Anyone think of a scripture? Yeah. So... The, the one that first got yelled at was, bear one another's burdens. And that's in Galatians 6 and verse 2. And I just, I just wanted to um, really encourage everyone here this morning. When I first came here, not 12 months ago yet, um, I had 0.9% lung capacity, which is not much. And my respiratory specialist said to me, Diane, you're on the way out. All your organs are dying. You haven't got enough oxygen in your system. You're on the way. So I thought, mm, that's a fairly serious, but if not here, then with the Lord there. So I'm not too concerned. So then I came here, and by the end of February, I had 100% lung capacity. You know, you actually wrapped me in love that was undeniably the love of Christ. And I just wanted to encourage each one of you this morning, as you pray for each other, you are making a difference. You are making a big difference. My bear is not doing what he's supposed to be doing. Okay. Well, this bear is not 
the one that says bear each other's burdens, but I really wanted to thank you all for praying for me this morning. This bear is a barista bear. You know what a barista bear is? Well, it's a coffee bear, yeah. And what happens to coffee? He brews it, yes. Yeah. So this is Hebrews 12, verse 2. Hebrews, it says, Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. Now, I always bring a little aid because I want you to remember Hebrews 12. How many disciples did Jesus have? How many months in a year? What's the number after 11? So now you'll remember that Hebrews 12 verse 2 says, Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. The other reason I bought this bear was because it reminds me of children and I wanted to tell you a testimony of when our children were small. For some reason, which I cannot recall why, we were having communion at home and we, had, we have three children. One was ten, one was eight and one was four. Ross said, we're not going to church today, we're going to be having it at home. Our eight-year-old went, I'll preach, I'll preach, I'll preach, I'll preach, Dad, please, let me preach, let me preach, let me preach, let me preach, let me preach. Let me. Ross goes, no, 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 we're not going to have any preaching, we're just going to have communion together. Oh, I'll pray, I'll pray, I'll pray, I'll pray, I'll pray. Ross goes, okay, because you've asked enthusiastically, I shall let you pray over communion. And remember, Greg, give thanks. So communion was on the little coffee table. Robert and Rosalind were seated on a three-seater lounge. Ros and I on single lounges. Greg knelt down in front of the coffee table and sat back on his haunches. And then he started. Lord, thank you for the leaves on the trees. And Lord, thank you for the twigs that hold the leaves on the trees. And Lord, thank you for the branches that hold the twigs that keep the leaves on the trees. Oh, and Lord, thank you for the trunks that hold the branches that keep the twigs and leaves on the trees. And Lord, thank you for the bark because that protects the trees. And Lord, thank you, thank you, Lord, for the roots because that keeps them strong in the ground. And then he went, Lord, thank you for the national forests. And Ross and I started to look at each other, you know, how long is this prayer going to go? Lord, thank you for echidnas because they are Australian. And Lord, thank you for kangaroos and emus. And this prayer went on and on. I won't go into all the detail this morning because we'd still be here at lunchtime. Thank you, Lord, he's going. Thank you for all these things. Thank you for all the animals in the parks, the national forests. Thank you, Lord. So he's sitting back on his haunches and all of a sudden he went from his haunches to full kneel and he went, and I stand again, circuses and zoos in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, son of the living God. And that's what Ross and I did. We chuckled and looked at each other. And then in a sweet little voice, he said, because they whip the animals. And Jesus, you know what that's like. Because they whipped you before they took you to the cross of Calvary. The presence of God swept into our lounge room and we fell on our faces, weeping before God. Because of the realisation that a small child might not seem to have the focus of what he's supposed to be praying for. But all along, he was leading to the place we all need to come on a daily basis. He was leading us to the cross of Calvary. This morning we hold in our hands the emblems that represent what Jesus Christ did for us. He was whipped and broken that our bodies might be made whole. And that is why we come and sit around this table every, every week. Some people do it every day. And when I think about how Gregory prayed that morning... And how much there was a longing in his heart to get the message across that Jesus Christ died for every single person that is ever on the planet. This morning, let's pray together. Father, thank you for the broken body of Jesus Christ. Thank you for every stripe that was laid on his back. 
thank you, Lord, for these things that Jesus has done for us. We take and eat, remembering this morning that his body was broken. Take everyone and eat. And then the cup is a representative of the blood that was spilt. Jesus, we drink this morning, thanking you for salvation in your precious name. Amen. I must add that the end of the prayer went something like this for Gregory that morning. Oh, and Jesus, one or two circuses and zoos would be okay as long as they don't whip the animals. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look at him. He's the focus. Amen. 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 Did you know that it's so easy to lose sight of reality? And one of those areas where we get overcome is when things have gone so very bad and very wrong in our lives or we're in pain or distress or we're not well. And I thank God that we live in Australia and we have a remarkable medical system and it's always been criticised because improvements can happen and that's good. But sometimes we put our trust in medical science more than we put our trust in the Lord. Now I have a very good GP and I know that throughout Townsville we have some remarkable minds with remarkable experience and training in our specialists and uh, we've got a wonderful university hospital here and a wonderful private system as well. Having said that, I want to ask you this morning if you're not well, if you're not really well, 100%, I'm going to pray for you that you'll be healed in the name of Jesus on the basis of what we have just done. We have taken the emblems of the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus, who was wounded for our transgressions, who was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Now, have you got a body that is in obedience to that? Have you got a mind and emotions that are obedient to that? Because depression and oppression and suppression are all included in that. Stripes, plural. Diseases. None of these diseases need to absolutely control you. I am the best in health that I've been for years. Eight weeks ago, I was healed um, of an arthritic condition in my knees. The pain is completely gone. Absolutely. Abilio prayed for me in our London hotel for a calf muscle problem. That was healed by the time I got down in the elevator to the ground floor, completely healed and hasn't come back. If you are unwell this morning, I'd like you to stand where you are. And those that are staying away because you're not feeling up to it or not terribly well, you should have been here this morning because there's going to be healing in the name of Jesus. So if you're not 100% and you're not well, I want you to stand where you are. There's no shame in being unwell. There's no shame in being troubled. There's no shame in being oppressed. There's no shame in being depressed or having mental anxiety or mental problems. There's no shame in this. These are sinless infirmities. And uh, we know that uh, sickness came as a result of sin, but it may not be your sin. It's original sin. And that's what the Saviour came to heal us from. Amen. Praise God. Now, I want the congregation to look around and you can see a number of people there. You know most of them or some of them. And I want you to go to them where they are and I want you to lay hands because the Bible doesn't say just for the elders to come, but it says, these signs shall follow them that believe. Now, if you're a believer, I want you to go to someone, maybe one or two, and I want you to lay your hands on them, take them by the hand, and begin to pray as I lead you. Would you do that right now? So I'll give you a minute or two to get there, or less than that. 
and in the name of Jesus, begin to start praying for one another right now. Hallelujah. And if we run out of prayers, well, maybe you who are infirm would like to reach over to a friend that's standing nearby, and we're going to believe. Now, don't, don't interfere with the person seeking with the Lord. Just begin to pray right now in the name of Jesus. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we come. We thank you this power in your name. We thank you this power in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord, this blessing and healing. And I pray that healing will flow into bodies right now. We heard one glorious testimony this morning. And Lord, we thank you for that healing that took place. Now in the name of Jesus, I pray that, Lord, there will be complete healing, that pain will go, that in the name of Jesus, we don't plead you, we thank you, Lord. We don't plead with you. We thank you. We thank you. We say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your abundant grace, your tender mercy. Thank you, Lord, that you are on the throne, that you are good, that your mercy endures forever. Lord, bless each person today. Father, I pray that you'll deal with lies, especially the lie that says, I'm getting old, you've got to expect this. No, in the name of Jesus, we withstand that lie this morning and we say, as your days, so shall your strength be. Hallelujah. Bless your servants. Lord, bless those that are, Lord, encumbered with uh, emotional upsets, those that are depressed, those that are anxious, those that are tormented. We break the power of torment in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Let's praise the Lord now. Because the Bible says, let your requests be made known with thanksgiving. That means expectancy. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen and amen. And all the people said. Good. I believe for it, dear ones. I'm very anxious that you be strong in the Lord spiritually and in the power of his might, which is mentally, emotionally, and physically. I want you to be absolutely bursting, Amen. bursting, and not with calories. <laughs> That's another problem, isn't it? Well, praise God that you're going to be well. Amen. I am going to be well. Hallelujah. Oh, as my days, so shall my so shall my strength be. She's got it. <laughs> By George, she's got it. <laughs> praise the Lord. Amen. Well, praise God. Now it's going to be a busy week because prayer time is Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock and then again at 7 at Riverway for Stable at Riverway. Uh, we had a wonderful time, a really great time at those special meetings we had during last week. Golden years, I'm sorry you missed it, but uh, if you did, well, make sure you don't miss the last one, which is in, is it November or December, did you say? Hmm? Yeah, the breakup is in December, and uh, not the breakdown, the breakup. And then we had the men's fellowship on Friday. We had a wonderful time. If you were one of the brothers, why weren't you there? Oh, you missed it. It was one of oh, the food. <laughs> Enough to repent over, I can tell you. Because it wasn't tea time. It was supper time. I tell you what. I'll come prepared next week or next month or whenever it is, the next one. Oh, no, that's a breakfast at a, at a venue yet to be decided on. And it'll be, a, I suppose, a fat-filled breakfast for fat-filled men. But we had a wonderful time. And may I say, Pastor Peter, your testimony was wonderful. It was really, it was really very heartwarming. And we had some brothers from uh, Sri Lanka... Uh, a pastor, well, both of them are pastors, and we enjoyed meeting them, and, uh, and Pastor Ross and Di's son brought them 
uh, Greg because he's just returned from a ministry trip there. And we just had a wonderful time all round. Beautiful balmy weather and a few balmy men together. They were, uh, you know, just enjoying themselves. I sat back and I watched them and they're chatting and rejoicing and Henry brought his modern model aeroplane and started it up and made poor Peter hold on to it. He wouldn't hold on to it himself and I thought any minute the power of that thing, I thought we were going to see Peter go flying off into the backyard at our house but anyway fortunately he's another Clark Kent and uh, he was able to withstand that. Well, praise God for that. Let's take the offering, shall we, and give to the Lord. Could we look at offering in the same spirit as our worship? Do you know what? You're not giving God anything that belongs to you anyway. Did you notice that? Everything you give is something that he initially gave you. You're giving back. So you're honouring him with what he's already given you. And when we take the tithe and give it to him, we are honouring the Lord with our substance. And when we give over and above that gifts of love and devotion, it's marvellous how God blesses it, prospers it, and how in all times financially how he will prove himself faithful. So God bless you as you give. And uh, I just want to drop a thought before Pastor Ross comes this morning. I've been exercised again in the spirit uh, yesterday, and I was talking to Abilio. We were talking about a number of things that provoked this, uh, this desire to pray and get a word. Do you know that we are to be very aggressive when it comes to faith? You know, sometimes we feel that a Christian's going to be sort of almost merely mouthed and sentimental and sweet and saccharine-like. You know, there comes a time when believers really rise up and they are very strong, very determined, very focused, and they're like the widow woman who really made a pest of herself to the unrighteous judge. And, of course, Jacob was like that. He said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. I'm not letting you go. He said that to the angel of the Lord. And God respects that. And I want to just remind you, dear friends, I want to remind you that God wants you to cast all your care upon him. And the operative word is cast. When you toss something... There's not a great deal of energy in that. You just toss a coin. You toss a stone. But when you cast it, there's determination in it. And it's an action word. And you're to cast your cares upon him, for he cares for you. And he wants you free of that care. But, of course, the psalmist says the same thing. Cast your burden upon the Lord. Cast it. I will not have this burden. I will not take this burden to myself. I cast it out. Do you know when you come across a demon, and I've seen a lot of demon-possessed people delivered over the years. Thankfully, it doesn't happen every day. But the Bible says in the Great Commission, they will cast out demons. Get out! Get out! Get out! And you've got to withstand the enemy... Come on, learn to withstand me. Don't be one of these oh, I don't know what going on. moaning Christians don't get anything. But those that rise to the occasion and cast that thing out in the name of Jesus, they go. I had a tussle with some demons in Melbourne once, of course, they, they inhabit Melbourne, of course. And, uh, but I had a tussle with some demons once there in, in a pastor's home. It wasn't the pastor. It was someone they brought into the home. And, you know, that demon spoke back to me. 
in a vicious way and, and accused and blasphemed like the, the Lord's name like you wouldn't believe. And I got up and he threatened me and I went towards him in the name of Jesus and I said, you get out, you filthy devil, and don't come back. And about eight years later, I went to speak again in Melbourne and this young man came up to me. He said, do you remember me? My name's Phil. I said, yes. And I said, and you look pretty filled. And he said, I'm the one that you delivered from those demons that I had from the age of four unto 31. And he said, they've never come back. And I said, good. They were inside of him. There were three, weren't there? Three demons out of him. Eunice was in the next room with... Uh, Elizabeth Nichols praying and they could hear the screams and the yells that's another story for another time hallelujah I was praying in Sydney once and I was praying for a certain uh, sector of society that need the Lord and I opened my eyes as I was kneeling in prayer and in the doorway bigger than the doorway was this demonic prince and I was so intrigued, I had no fear. Oh, no, no, I didn't feel any fear at all. I thought, oh, what an odd-looking thing you are. And it looked like something out of the Muppets. It was big and hairy, and I thought it looked rather funny, actually, more than frightening. And then I said, oh, in the name of Jesus, get out of here. You get out of here. I'd been praying for the gay community because someone asked me to. I hadn't had any thought of doing it. And then they asked me to do it, and I did. And this thing came towards me, threateningly. Oh, I said, get out of here. You don't belong in this church. This is the Lord's. Get out. And the thing ran towards me, and then over the top. I never saw it again. And the next week, two young homosexuals got saved. One's a grandfather today. Uh, Oh, two of them are grandfathers today. And then we had about 15 of these out of that background got saved within a few months. God broke through. Hallelujah. You cast out these things. Don't get mealy-mouthed and, oh, please, if it be your will, you know, that... You don't want that kind of praying. Be decisive. Amen. Hallelujah. Casting all your cares. Casting out demons. Wonderful, isn't it? And cast the preacher who's taking time for the other preacher off the platform and back into his seat where he belongs. God bless Pastor Ross. Let me just go on with that determination. I've been talking to you about d d drilling down to tap into the well of the Holy Spirit over the last few weeks. And we need to have that sort of determination. When I stood out there at Julia Creek just a few weeks ago and saw that artesian water flowing up through that bore, that bore went down probably about 1,000, 1,500 feet. It took, it took some determination to drill down to receive that water. But when, when you drilled down and you re tapped into the artesian supply, that river of living water would flow. And I'm here today to encourage you to tap into the Holy Spirit, to have that same determination that strength within you that says, I'm, I need more from you, Lord. I just need to tap in more and more to you. That's been my message over the last few weeks. And I want to tell you, I have been absolutely transformed in the last probably couple of months by that understanding of tapping into the Holy Spirit. Because when Jesus said, you shall receive that rivers of living water shall flow within you, that rivers of living water, and it will bring life and life more abundantly. Amen? Yes. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Now that we've got that out the way, I wonder if you've heard of the word reverse engineering. <coughs> reverse engineering. To see things like the designer sees them. To take something that's been made and then to be able to look at it and work out just how that designer came to that conclusion. And it's an amazing thing to have to do. And I want to, and the, the um, title of my message is, I want what he's got. I want to see into the kingdom of heaven. I want to see the one who created us 
and understand a little bit about the creation that he has created and how he wants to have relationship with us and do that through, of course, the Holy Spirit. It was October 3, 1942, when German scientists for the very first time and engineers had lifted a 13-ton rocket into space through a, a rocket engine that had been designed. It had never been done before, and it was an amazing accomplishment. The problem was that in two years' time, after that, 1944, September 1944, they turned it into a weapon to be used against France and against England, of course, and you'd know it as the V-2 rocket. But the British and American scientists were really, really keen to want to try and capture one of these, or at least get one that failed so that they could look at it and reverse engineer, because the German scientists had had such a profound input into how to make that jet engine. You might just see a rocket go up and think that's marvelous, but I want to tell you, to lift a 13-ton rocket, you need something like 125,000 litres of fuel coming in every second into that motor. And to do that, you need a 600 horsepower pump. And to drive that pump, you need a, they in fact made a steam turbine pump that would pump out 600 horsepower, develop 125 litres of ethanol and liquid oxygen poured into that motor where it's burnt and gives the thrust necessary to lift that engine. To do that in those days was an impossible thing. They tried and tried and tried, but the German scientists had cracked it, and so the Americans and the English were very keen to want to get one and reverse engineer it. Fortunately, the war ended pretty soon after that time, and they were able to transform hundreds of them back to England and, and to the United States and, and look at the marvel of how the German engineers had accomplished that particular feat and I just look at it and I watch it over and over again. That's the thing that I'm interested in. Uh, is, is, but they had to reverse engineer it and from that then they, they were able to manufacture engines themselves. Of course it really, really helped and this is the key that I want to say to you this morning. It really helped when about 150 of the scientists that worked in Germany moved across to England and to the United States, they were the designers of it. They were able to come and explain it in more detail. I want to suggest to you that when we understand the designer and have the designer come into our presence and be able to sit down and explain the engine to us and explain creation to us, suddenly we've got an understanding that we've never had before. My thought to you this morning is we have the Holy Spirit who brings us to Jesus Christ, the designer, the author and finisher of our faith, the one who's designed us. And when we are in his presence, how much more knowledge do we gain of the kingdom of God? You get my drift this morning? I, you can listen to me talk till the cows come home and you say, oh, that's nice, Ross. I want to understand the world around us a bit more. Well, I want to understand the world a lot more. Go, go, go to the creator. And not only have the Creator's handbook, which we all have as our Bibles, but actually go to the design engineer himself. Amen? Amen. Praise God. That's what I want to talk to you about this morning. Paul's baptism in the Holy Spirit is recorded in Acts chapter 9, verse 18. I'm just going to just mention it by passing. But it says this, that where he, you know he had an encounter with Jesus on the Damascus road and for three days he was blind. He was led into Damascus. Ananias, a faithful believer, was sent by God to go and pray for him to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Ananias comes, prays for Paul, who's now, he's been totally switched off from the world that he had, the world of being a Pharisee, he understood the word, but now he's had an encounter with the author, and now Ananias comes, and what happens when he receives the baptism of the Holy Spirit? It says something like scales fell from his eyes. And suddenly he could see the world in a whole different way. He could see, because the Holy Spirit now dwelt within him, the Holy Spirit giving him that creator's detail. And Paul goes on to write more than half of your New Testament which has an incredible insight into the kingdom of heaven. Like never before, he had all the pharisaical knowledge, but now he, he could reverse engineer because he had the engineer with him, the Holy Spirit revealing Jesus, who was there at creation, speaking into his life as it is with you and I. 
And so as the Holy Spirit is speaking into you and I, I want you and I to be so filled with the Holy Spirit that we have the designer working within us. John 1.1 1, 1 opens up, beautiful phrasing. John opens up and he says, In the beginning was the Word. Later on he would go to say, Jesus is that Word. It's a funny sort of way of expressing it, you know, Jesus is the word, you know, it's like, like one of the hippies, hey, what's the word, Ross, you know, what's the word, brother? You know, back in the 60s, you'd remember those phrases. No, you don't, okay. It's okay, some of you don't remember anything from then, do you? No, right. Uh, but you know, if I wanted to say, if I said to you, who's the, who's, what do we need to know about piano playing? And you would go, Tony's the word, pastor, he's the word. He's got the knowledge, he's got all the ability, he's the, he's the man. And, and John is saying this, he says, in the beginning was the Word. Of course, later on, a few verses down, I think it's, I don't know, 15 or 16, somewhere, don't bother looking it up right now. But he says, John says, the Word was Jesus. Okay, so Jesus was there, right there at the beginning, before all matter. He was there before time. He did not come into being, he was just there. Einstein's theory of relativity talks about, he, he was able to, Einstein was able to discover that matter is re, in relationship to time and, 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 and the, the, the whole process of matter is energy and, and, uh, and the speed of light. And he's able to look at that and he was able to look at how matter that we have, like this pulpit, for example, is made of wood that's all made of matter. And, and he was able to say that, that can, that's made by energy. There's a huge sense of energy, a huge amount of energy, in fact. If you reverse that around, by the way, if you turn this pulpit into energy, you would level Townsville with just the energy contained in this matter in this pulpit. Such as, uh, that's the, the Einstein's relativity law, and you would have seen that written up everywhere, you know, energy equals um, mass times the speed of light squared. Uh, yeah, you all know that, that's a science lesson, so let's move on. <laughs> but we, when we're in his presence, when we're in the designer's presence, we have an understanding of the world around us like no one else has. It's quite amazing. In Jude 24, let me just pick this one up for you. Jude 24, yeah, the, the highlight of this is going to be plant, he plants you firmly in his presence. So you're going to be with the designer. Now to the one who can keep you upright and plant you firmly in his presence. By the way, what do I mean by being in his presence? A few years ago, oh, about 40, 50 years ago now, I was commissioning a television system that was uh, made by NEC, Nippon Electric Company, and the television system was uh, low-powered transmitters, but they went from basically Roma, Mitchell, Morvan, uh, Charleville, up to Augustella and so forth. And I was, I was tasked with commissioning those systems. And the NEC sent out their design engineers to work with me as we commissioned it. So I had two engineers, Mr. Ito and Mr. Oya, and uh, they could speak enough English and we could lay out the plans of the transmitters and all the, all the circuitry and so forth, and we spoke the same electronic language. But I had never seen transmitters perform to the specifications that they had. That, that in fact, the specifications were so far with, uh, exceeded what we were expecting and exceeded anything we had ever had anywhere else ever before that we found it hard to believe that transmitters could be that good. And so we, I, I, my, I was commissioned, my engineer above me, commissioned, he walked over to me and he says, right, he says, keep the blighters honest, Ross, or words to that effect, you can understand, but I won't say that. Keep the blighters honest. And, uh, and then it meant don't let them cheat on anything. So any, but I got to know these guys personally, and when I realized that they were the designers of the equipment, oh, didn't it open up the entire circuitry and make it so understanding? I could have sat there and read through the circuitry and worked it out slowly, but to have the designer there, in a fraction of the time, I could just ask him a question, and there was the answer. And so it is when you know Jesus Christ, when you're in his presence, planted firmly in his presence clean, unmarked, and joyful in the light of his glory to the one 
and only God our Saviour, through Jesus the Anointed our Lord, be glory and greatness and might and authority, just as it has been, before, uh, been since before he created time. May it continue now and into eternity. Amen. You know, that's, that's just a beautiful phrase. It just links it in with what I want to say, that I want you to understand that the Holy Spirit will bring you into the presence of Jesus. That's the job of the Holy Spirit, by the way is to glorify Jesus Christ. It's not to glorify you with gifts and mighty power and leap tall buildings in a single bound. It's to glorify Jesus Christ. You know, I want Jesus Christ to be glorified in this place today. Amen. And that's for the Holy Spirit to work in each one of your lives. There's people watching online that even now the Holy Spirit's touching and bringing something to work and bear in, in their lives. I think of, you know, talking on this whole thing of science and so forth, you know, you've got great scientists that have gone before us that have been believers. Morse, Kepler, Pastor, George Washington Carver. Oh, that, that's a story in itself. George Washington Carver was a committed Christian, baptized in the Holy Spirit. He was a, 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 a black man living in the northern part of the United States and majored in biology and uh, went down south because they'd asked him to come down. He left his very prestigious place and went to the south. You can imagine the difference, you know, the black-white relationships back in the 20s and 30s and so forth. And he went down south into Alabama and so forth and there taught the, taught the people how to grow cotton properly because they, they were struggling in yield dem demands and so forth. They were very, the, the crops were very poor. And he went down and showed them how to deal with the soil and, and, uh, and, and the whole lot. Great story. I'll share that with you someday. But it was an amazing story how he was moved one day in prayer, reading in Genesis how the seeds were given for the, for the healing of the nations and so forth and for, for our food. And uh, that's a whole different story because he ended up growing peanuts and developing some 300 different products from peanuts. Now you're thinking, what possible blues could you have? Well, well there's, there's dye from the colouring, for example, from the red, the, the skins. There's, there's peanut paste. There's even ice cream. <laughs> there's even, a, even something that you can look like coffee when you try to drink it. A bit of a worry, but... Anyhow, that's for another story. But you know, the interesting thing is our Creator has created us and put us within this framework to live, and I, I'm just absolutely blown away by that. It, any, any scientist, any doctor, any, uh, anyone that works in any industry at all, electronics or the whole lot, can all look and say, well, how did the designer make this? We looked at, uh, uh, you know, model airplanes on Friday night at the men's thing. And, you know, the, the, the whole thing of flight came about because men could watch birds flying. Today we study things like uh, uh, dragonflies and try to work out how they can hover like they do. We look at geckos and the study of geckos, how a gecko can hold its own body weight on a glass surface. It's not only that it can hold its own body weight, but it can actually run and stay there. You want to get into the science of that? Hello? Talk to the designer. Every one of my friends that's into all of these industries, when they say, that, Ross, we start with the premise that God created it, and I've just got to, I just got to uh, reverse engineer it. And it's amazing what you come up with. I love the fact that God's put parameters on us so we don't get too smart. He's made absolute zero. We can't get below minus 273 degrees Celsius, which is zero degrees Kelvin, for those that want to know. Once we get beyond that, matter doesn't exist anymore. We can't get to it. That's the holy grail of getting down to it. We've got within a millionth of a degree of it. At that point, things start to change. Things become weird. You, you, anyone that's had an MRI done in the hospital, they're sitting with a, with a helium-cooled electromagnets. They helium-cool them so that the conductors in those magnets become superconductors, which means that helium gets down to about four degrees above that, that absolute zero, and the conductors become superconductors. So when you put a current through those conductors, there's no resistance for the, con for the, vo for the current to stop. So once they've charged the thing and got it running with current, the current stays there forever as long as you keep the temperature down close to absolute zero. That's amazing, isn't it? And, and what about the speed of light? We can't go past the speed of light without mass becoming huge. So I say, yeah, I'm not putting on weight, I'm getting closer to them getting faster. 
See, the speed of light is 300,000 kilometres a second. Now, I can measure that quite easily. I can measure down to microseconds very simply, very easily. I've done it many times. Measure the signal going up to a transmitter and coming back again, how many microseconds is. I can tell you how far away the transmitter is. We do it with radar. We do it with 100 different things. Oh, anyhow, all of that says this. <laughs> we need to position ourselves with the Creator, amen? And when we do, we can understand the world around us so much better. Let me just pick up this scripture here. It's in Matthew. Oh, I had that one all the time, didn't I? It's in Matthew 13. Jesus is actually up around the Sea of Galilee. Hundreds of people are interested in what he's got to say. They come down to the shore of Galilee. Jesus gets in a boat and he goes out and he sits there and he talks to them in parables. Parable, 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 trying to get them to understand the kingdom of heaven, which is way beyond them. It's like me trying to explain to you, uh, you know, how a nuclear power plant works. You know, it, it, it may be beyond your science. And so to, uh, you know, to do that, I have to try and explain it in quite simple terms. Jesus is trying to explain the kingdom of heaven in parables. And, and he says this, and he's just, he asks his disciples, ask him, why do you do that? Why do you speak to the people in parables? And he replied, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. Oh, yes. You know, as we come close to Jesus, he wants us to come in close, and the Holy Spirit is there for us to try and understand. You try and talk to somebody about the kingdom of heaven that doesn't know Jesus Christ as Saviour. And it's like you're talking about a foreign place. It's weird. They, don't even, they can't grasp it. So you talk about being born again. You talk about, you know, why Jesus had to be crucified. You talk about what, what does it matter if people want to carry on with their own sexual bents and so forth? What's it matter if people want to follow after their own lusts and things? Well, when you understand who you are in Jesus Christ, then you see it from God's perspective and it makes a whole different view on things. That's for another day. I'm, I haven't got the time to go into that. But I want to take you this morning, I want to just shift for a moment and take you perhaps to a type that helps us to understand what it is to be in his presence. When the Hebrews came out, when the Jewish people came out, they were called Jews later on down the track, by the way, but the, the Hebrews, when they were there in Egypt and they came out of Egypt and they're uh, in the wilderness and uh, God's talking to Moses and he's pretty disgusted with the whole lot and Moses says, no, 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 if you don't go with us, then we're nothing. He wanted them, he, Moses understood, hey, without you, Lord, I'm nothing. And I would suggest the same to you and I. Without the Lord, we're nothing. We're aimlessly wandering around through life. We've got no one to turn to when things go crook. We've got no one to turn to when we, we don't understand the world around us. How many times have I, you know, raising our kids as teenagers? It doesn't change much. They're 50 now, but... <laughs> You know, I would just run out of myself and I think, God, I don't know what to do. I'm supposed to be the father of this household, but I don't know what to do. And I'd have to go down, I'd go down the backyard under the mango tree and say, God, I don't know what to do. You're going to have to help me. Every time I prayed like that, within 20 minutes, he'd give me an understanding of the next step. Often it was, God, Ross, you need to repent. <laughs> okay, move along. But I want to take you to, Moses said, hey, if you don't go with us, then we're nobody. And so God said, oh, all right, okay, okay. I want you to make, make this dwelling place. I want you to make a meeting place where I can come and meet with you. And we'll call it, it's going to, a tabernacle is the word we use, a meeting place. And I'm going to make it, uh, I want you, I'm going to give you very specific designs for it. Very specific measurements and how to make it. Don't deviate from it. Do exactly as I tell you and I will come and dwell with you. See, Moses knew what it was to have the creator of the universe with it. The Holy Spirit realizes that. And you and I need to realize it today. We need to have the creator within us. Anyhow... Of course, they made the tabernacle, and I'm sure you've all had studies on the tabernacle and so forth, and the great outer court, which is covering a couple of acres, and, and uh, you know, it's got a big curtain around it as a fence, and you come into the outside part, and there's that, the outer courts, 
that you come into where there's uh, you know big brazen layer, big brazen altar where uh, animals are sacrificed, blood is spilt. It's the equivalent of the cross. Okay. Uh, then, you, then you move to a place where you have a big bowl of uh, beautiful brass that's polished, po polished bronze filled with water and you can wash, you can wash all that blood and stuff from the sacrifices off you. And, you know, and then you move into, right in front of you then is a tent, quite high ceilings, uh, you know, and it's, uh, you know, it's an, a, a, a tent that's closed with curtains. Now we're getting in closer and closer. And you move in through that first opening of that tent, divided into two sections. You move into the first, and there you've got, in that room when the curtain closes behind you, you've got a golden lampstand on your left with seven lamps burning. And then, then you over to your right, you've got a little golden table with, with 12 loaves of fresh bread on there. And right in front of you is, a, is another golden altar, and it's, it's about the size of this pulpit. And uh, on there, there's some, uh, uh, some heat and so forth from coals, coals that have been brought in from the, from the uh, uh, altar that's outside. Never bring in false coals. Never bring in your own. Oh, I'll just take home some out of me fire at home and bring in. No, the people that did that and they died. Anyhow, God says, no, no, this is the process I want you to come through. And so they come to this place. They come to, then they step beyond that then into this place called the holiest of holies. It's just basically a small room, but there's only one piece of furniture in there. And that, that's, a, that's a, you know, like a woman's glory box. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's the uh, Ark of the Covenant. They called it that. It's a, it's, a, it's a box that's made of acacia wood. It's all covered in gold. It's, you've got these two uh, uh, gold angels on top of it uh, to, pointing towards each other, and the lid can be lifted up and removed. If you were to lift the lid up and remove that, inside of that would be three objects. One would be the, uh, the stone tablets of the law. The second would be Aaron's rod, that had budded. Remember when Aaron's rod budded? And the third one is a bowl of manna. These are the three things within there. Now you've got to understand something about this holiest of holies. This is what I want to share with you. And I've probably shared this detail with you before, but it's just a passion of mine and I'll share it a little bit with you today. When you're in the holy of holies, there's no artificial light. There's no smoke machine. <laughs> from the, pray, the altar of praise and prayer. You know, we think sometimes in church we've got to have smoke machines and lights and stuff. When you're in the holiest of holies, there's no, there's no smoke, there's nothing, there's no light, except the glory of God, the, what they call the Shekinah glory. There's no lampstand, there's nothing except you. And it speaks of being in the very presence of, of Christ, or the presence of God, as they would know it in that terms, but you and I would know it as, as the presence of Jesus. See, outside in the, in the holy place and in the, in the, out in the outer court is all about the work that Jesus did, all about the things he did on the cross and, and so forth, and the way he was baptized and, and the way he led us into the Holy Spirit and to give us praise and worship and all of that stuff. But when we move beyond that into the holiest of holies, it's not about his work, it's about him. There's a personal relationship with him right there into that holy place. This is the creator of the universe you're having a relationship with. Whoa. You want to understand how the world ticks? Get with the designer. Don't have to try and reverse engineer it without him. Oh, yeah, we can, we can read his handbook. And we can look at life around us. And I often, people have, often people say, oh, I just understand life, Ross. You don't have to preach to me about the Bible and about Jesus and everything. I understand life, you know. I, got, uh, you know I, I reckon that God is like this. I reckon God is just all love and he just loves us all. And I reckon God is this and I reckon God's... And I, it's, it's I reckon theology. I can look at a piece of equipment. I can look at that screen, that monitor. And I reckon this is how it works. But I, when I go to the designer and talk to them about it, 
oh, I know, Ross, this is why I've got it that there, and this is why I've got this here. It suddenly becomes a whole lot clearer. So when we're in his presence, suddenly these things make all the difference. I open the lid of this glory box. I keep on thinking glory box like the, the days, you know, the ladies, remember the days when before you get married you'd have a glory box? They don't do it anymore. I don't know if they had that anymore. The glory chest or the hope chest. And anyhow, our hope chest, Diane's hope chest, was filled with $600 worth of Rena Ware saucepans, which is like about three or $4,000 in today's value, but they're beautiful. So they've still got them today. We still use them. <laughs> How'd they get into that? Don't know. Don't know. I'd like a drink. In there, you've got the... You've got the stone tablets. What do the stone tablets speak of? Law and order. Good thing I haven't got my forex stubby holder in it. <laughs> Don't have any anymore. Tony, what, what, what? What's Ross on to? It's okay. Praise God. There's law and order. When you understand the kingdom of heaven, there is law and order. You've only got to look at the universe itself and the order in which that works. You've only got to look at your body and the way in which your heart pumps, you know, the thousands of litres of blood the heart that pumps all by itself every day. What's it, about 7,000 litres a day? That's a pretty impressive pump. I'm 76 years of age. How many days have I lived and had that pump still pumping 7,000 litres every day? Whoa, that's pretty scary. But there's beautiful law and order design. You know, when in, the, in those commandments, you know, you don't have any other gods but me. And don't, don't build any graven images. Don't have anything false. You know, don't have a Ford motor car and put a Holden sticker on it. You know, you haven't changed it at all. You know, you don't take the name of the Lord in vain and so forth. And remember, you know, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. I'm glad there's a Sabbath today. I've been working flat out on, a, on one, of me, one of me properties and oh, I'm in the process of painting it now. And uh, I, I just, yesterday I was exhausted. I said, ah, oh, thank God for my day of rest today. So this is my day of rest. I'm having fun today. You shall not murder, commit adultery, not steal. These are all great things for us to live together with. Amen? So it gives law and order. The other one is manna, provision of God. In that day, when you're in God's presence, these are the things that are there. When you're in God's presence, there's law and order in your life. You don't have to think sometimes. You don't have to think, is this right or is that wrong? God's already told you that it's, that it's, that whether it's right or wrong. You know, it's pretty easy to understand. But miraculous provision is there. Miraculous. How many people have had miraculous provision from one time or another? Little things, small things. I have little things that happened. A little thing that happened to me just the other day. Stupid little thing, you know, you wouldn't even be interested in. I'm going to tell you, so you will be interested now. But I'm cleaning this place up, and this place has been with, with tenants and so forth, and it's, it's over an acre in size, and they've had 11 shipping containers on it. You know, you can just imagine the stuff that was all over it. In amongst the grass, I pick up this steel punch. It's all pretty rusted, but it's a steel punch. You know, about this long, and it's about probably about 8 millimetre in the diameter at the punch end, and steel punch. And I threw it in the bucket, and I thought, oh, well, that'll stop running over with the mower later on. But what would I need that for? One day later... One day later, I needed a punch to punch out a bolt that I needed. And I thought, now, and I rummaged through that bucket and pulled out. I thought, God provided a day ahead. It was just like I pulled it out, and it was like, the Lord provides, Ross. <laughs> you know, you think, ah, oh, that's just circumstantial. It happens over and over again. Sometimes I wish it had happened more, but, <laughs> but provision is there. When the manna was there, they gave them, when they didn't have anything in the wilderness, the manna appeared, and, and here was a bowl of manna. The interesting thing was it, that it's, note this, it's in, a, it's in a golden bowl. It's not just a handful of manna thrown in the box, but it's in a golden bowl. When God gives you provision, gives you things, he expects you to keep it in order. He expects you to manage it, not just willy-nilly throw it around. Imagine if you won $10 million in a lotto or something. Probably have to take out a lotto ticket to start with. You know, that's another story, isn't it? 
But imagine if you were suddenly given $10 million. Would you know what to do with it? Many people. <laughs> yes comes the answer because you've developed a golden bowl to manage. Without that, people get a paycheck, stick it in their bag, spend like it's no tomorrow. Next week they wonder why they can't pay their bills. Ask the accountant down in the front row here. You have to hold it in a golden bowl. I'll finish up with this. Aaron's rod was also there. Aaron's rod. When you're in the presence of Jesus, there's, no, there's, there's not only the, the sense of, of law and order and structure, there is also the provision, but there is that rod of authority. Aaron's rod spoke of... Of course, Aaron was being challenged on his authority. And the rod spoke of his authority. Amongst all the other clansmen, they put out their rods. And that one budded and, and for, for, shows that that was the one that God had blessed. That was the authority. Now, you and I move in the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. He's given us authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And that's meant to be, you know, let's deal with this thing. Let's cut its head off. We need to walk in that authority and power, but it's encased in love. Scientists these days are trying to work and develop what we call nuclear fusion. It's basically the sun, there's nuclear fusion. We've got nuclear fission, okay, that's nuclear power plants, but nuclear fusion is very safe to, it doesn't generate side products and so forth, but it burns at 20 million degrees centigrade and you can't contain it in any sort of containment except a magnetic bottle. And it takes more energy to contain it than the thing produces at the moment. So they're trying to produce, so they're trying to contain that power. You and I have the power of the Creator within us with the Holy Spirit, and, but it needs to be contained. It needs to, it needs to be handled properly. Otherwise, if it's not handled in love, then you're just becoming a noisy gong. And you're just becoming a pain in the neck to everyone. But you need to be able to handle that power and authority with love. If you don't, you become a gang member. One of the problems we're dealing with today is that, 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 that Muhammad thought that he was a great prophet, but because he wasn't recognized by the Jewish prophets, they said, no, you're not. He had them executed like a gang member would. And so Muhammad rose to power as a gang member, and today we have the whole the, the Muslim religion following along behind it because it, he wrote the Quran, which is all delivered by basically a, you know, the, the equivalent of a bikey gang. Now, that's pretty straightforward, and I'll probably get some emails about that. <laughs> but uh, but he, was, he was not recognized as a prophet. The, 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 the Jewish, the, the, no, you, you're not a prophet of God. And so he had his, had his, had his SS go out and execute them one by one. And that's, that's, that's where the hatred comes from today, because the Jews wouldn't recognize him right back then. I don't get the idea that the, the Muslims worship, uh, the, the, the Allah that they talk about is not the God that we know. Amen. Not the God that we know. You can call God by any name, but that's, they, they, what they call him is not the God. And the, and the Quran is not a holy book. This is going out on YouTube. This is really neat. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. Okay. The final thing is, as I finish up, the interesting thing, I, I just thought of this as I was finishing this message, preparing it. I thought there's one other thing that's in there in that, is these golden angels. Are not their angels ministering to those who inherit salvation? In the presence of Jesus, the creator and designer of the, the, the universe, who we're brought close to by this river of the life of the Holy Spirit flowing within us, he brings us close to this great designer so we can reverse engineer the world around us and make sense of it when we're with him. We try to work it out ourselves and we end in disaster. We need to work it out with him. Lord, you help me walk through this. 
you help me walk through the seasons of my life. You help me to do this, walk in these ways. Help me to, to walk with, with your understanding of, of the structure and the laws and so forth of the universe. Help me to understand the provision that you provide for us. Help, help me to understand the authority that I walk in, that I can speak the demons and say, be gone in the name of Jesus. Amen. And that you have ministering angels ministering, walking with us, helping us. Oh, God. Messed Lord. Matthew 13, 16. Blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. For truly I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. You and I are blessed with the Holy Spirit flowing within us. Gives us a privilege that very few people have. I'm going to finish now with a song. You just stay there, just absorb this song. Don Moen wrote this song and, and he, he plays it on his piano here this morning and sings it to us. Just take this song on board. It's about Jesus. I just want to be where you are, Lord. Dwelling daily in your presence. Amen. And I just want to be where you are, dwelling daily in your presence. I don't want to worship from afar. To where you are, and I just want to be. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you presence yourself with us. Holy Spirit, I'm so grateful that you fill every one of us with a knowledge of the presence of Jesus Christ. 
And through him we understand the creation around us. And as we grapple with the various issues, you're able to bring the answers that we need. And Lord, I just want to be with you. I just want to be in your presence. I want to be where you are, dwelling daily in your presence. Because what you've got is what I want. Amen? Amen. 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 You know, we're going to close.